I don't think you understand how close we were to having mammoths. Woolly mammoths used to be all over the dang place. They were what we call uh, circumpolar, but not even really. Look at them dipping down into freaking Ohio, all of Europe. It was just, it was a woolly mammoth's world. But then a few things happened. And there's a great deal of debate about which of them matters the most. The climate changed and people got really good at killing things. As much as I would like to, I'm completely uninformed, so we're not going to talk about the debate over whether humans were the main cause of the extinction of the woolly mammoths. But I do want to talk about how woolly mammoths probably had sex. And I feel like I could speak on this issue because who knows? Uh, you know. We've never seen it happen, but we do know some things. So if you just like start out your Googling with how did woolly mammoths have sex, which I've clearly already done a little bit of, <laughs> seems like the kind of thing I'd do. You could see that according to live science, woolly mammoths were seasonal sex fiends. I don't know if we needed to use the word fiend, just like modern elephants study finds. Elephants go into a thing called must, must, must. And you can see, uh, this is when the, the, the male elephants, it's like time for them to go. And you got signs like urine dribbling down the insides of the back legs, which can also happen to human men, but is not generally thought to be a sign of being like super attractive to females. And then there's also the secretion of this like stinky stuff through a gland on the side of their head. So you can tell if an elephant is in must. And if it is, don't hang out with that elephant. It's a bad vibe. So during must, they are extremely tr attractive or more attractive to females, but they are also surging with testosterone and they are more aggressive than your average elephant. And your average elephant, I wouldn't want to mess with, but one that has 10 times more testosterone than it usually does, that sounds like the kind of mood swings I don't want to get involved with. No, 60 times, 60 times its natural levels. But according to an analysis of ancient mammoth's tusks, they also underwent must. And they could tell this looking at the level of testosterone in the tusks. Tusks hold a particular promise for reconstructing aspects of mammoth life history because they preserve a record in layers of dentin that uh, form throughout the individual's life. That's very cool. As the tusk grows, you can actually detect certain times when they have increased levels of testosterone. So we know that woolly mammoths underwent must, which tells us two things. First, that they are like elephants in that regard. And second, that they are probably similar to elephants in other regards. And so if we want to ask ourselves what the sex lives of mammoths were like, we can kind of probably get away with looking at what the sex lives of modern elephants are like. And we know quite a lot about that. One thing that we know about elephant sex is that it requires uh, interest from both parties. Milo, don't show everybody everything that happened when I googled elephant sex. I think that would probably be a problem for the channel. But elephants are very big and that causes situations. One thing you will never see an elephant do is jump. You can see from the situation that this elephant is in that that is precarious. And it's not just like physically precarious, like, oh, it might not get in and might not work. It's precarious, like if something goes wrong, the male elephant could get hurt. That is a movement that is dangerous for a male elephant. And it is quite difficult to actually get into that position. I'm editing this video and I, I didn't love how I said this bit, so I'm coming back in to try and say it better. Uh, it seems like for physiological reasons, just their size, elephants are more likely to have both parties involved in sex doing mate selection, which is what it's called when a, a one mate chooses another mate. And so you have like bi-directional mate selection. Now you could have a really big, really persistent male that's in the middle of musk. He's just like pestering everybody and guarding a bunch of females. In that case, is the female also choosing or is it just the male that's choosing? But it isn't just physiological. You also see behaviors like older females will guard and protect younger females in a herd from like males who are in must and, and are overly aggressive. So it is just interesting to me that there seems to be like bi-directional mate selection going on in elephants for both physiological reasons and cultural reasons. And I say this because I think it is probably also true of mammoths. Anyway, let's go back into the thing. It does make me wonder about this rhino situation. Does the rhino want to be involved? Should I not be asking too many questions? We're gonna leave that behind and move forward from it. Oh boy. 
<laughs> We're all having a great time today. Okay, okay, all right. So, where did I end up here? Oh my gosh, would you look at this? This is a currently active backer kit project for absolutely gorgeous mammoth figures created by David Silva, who retired from the toy industry and instead decided to make scientifically accurate figures of prehistoric animals. And they have partnered with Eons, that delightful YouTube channel, to bring you some beautiful proboscideans. And it is true, there are some stretch goals, including a less expensive version of the mammoth. So we've got these 1 to 18 scale, and then I think that this other one is a 1 to 35 scale, maybe? You also can get the baby mammoth, which is absolutely adorable. I've held these in my hands, and they are so well done and beautiful, and you can back this backer kit project right now. There's a link in the description. And yeah, I did make this whole video because I want to tell you about these. But this is a true Kickstarter. We cannot make this if we do not hit the goal because the molds are too expensive to make. If you are interested in being a part of this, you just click on back it, and then you can find here the 1 18th scale woolly mammoth, or the baby for $35, or both the mammoth and the baby in the snowy variant or the 135 scale woolly mammoth for $55 has way fewer articulations but still a very good boy you can get all those things or you can just get one of it or you can just be a believer for a dollar already hundreds of people have signed up to get one of these things each one this is very cool includes three sets of tusks you got the male tusks the female tusks and the damaged tusks so you can set your mammoth up like a male or a female or a male who's been through it so excited to be making these with david silva and eons i hope it goes well so that we can do more cool things like this Female elephants go through an estrus cycle that's like four to six months or something. So it's a long period of time during which they are not fertile. And then in that period of time, they have like a week, maybe, that they are fertile. So males have their cycle. Females have their cycle. Uh, females who are ovulating are not particularly interested in males who are not in must. They tend to be more interested in older, larger males. Also, female elephants are fertile for a long time, like from the age of like 10 or 12 to 50 years old because like it takes years between breeding events. So a female elephant, I don't know, how long is elephant gestation? I know it's long. Elephant gestation, 22 months, longer than any living mammal. That's longer than whales, I guess. That's two years just from having sex to giving birth. And here's some early research from the 80s on how elephants do mating. There's male guarding, uh, and there's also female mate selection. So in this case, until the age of 25, males did not get access to females who were in estrus. Between the ages of 25 and 35, they obtained matings <laughs> during early and late, but never mid, and large must males over 35 years old guarded females in mid estrus. Larger, older males ranked above younger, smaller males, and the number of females guarded by males increased rapidly late in life. So because we know that there was must, in woolly mammoths. It's more or less a safe bet to say sex in mammoths was something like this. Also, I just remembered that I can tell you a cool fact that I know about elephants, which is that you've never seen elephant balls, unless you're like a scientist who's cut an elephant open because they're on the inside. They have internal testicles, uh, which is very cool. And I don't know why. Um, why? Why? Elephants' giant hot testicles might be the reason they get less cancer? This is why you go down rabbit holes, everybody. Because you get to read sentences like that. Elephants rarely get cancer and their giant hot <laughs> testicles might provide a clue as to why. P53, elephants have a lot of P53. This is a, a, a protective cancer gene that makes protective cancer proteins. Why is, the, why is the testicle involved then? Why did elephants evolve 20 copies of this gene? Volroth thinks it has to do with their testicles. I would have thought it has to do with the number of cells that they have and the fact that they don't want to get cancer. Many males, including humans, have their testicles primarily outside of their body to cool them down, which is believed to be important for creating a healthy batch of sperm. I have also, always, always, as a person who has studied comparative anatomy and physiology, thought this was dumb. You can just change your proteins to do the job at a different temperature, which organisms do all the time evolutionarily. But through a quirk of evolutionary history, elephant testicles are located inside their bodies. Okay, so I guess it's just a quirk of evolutionary history. But the potential to get really hot, therefore elephants have trouble making viable sperm, but if 
they had more copy editing proteins, the theory goes, that hot sperm would be protected from damage. All right, so what you're saying is, let me see if I follow this. We got sperm, actual reason, not just that the proteins can't handle it, but actual reason is the heat from the inside of the body makes the copying process less good, less effective, and thus introduces more mutations because just because there's more energy. And so in order to counteract that energy, you can do one of two things. One, you could do a bunch of biochemical stuff that's maybe like metabolically expensive, or you could just have the nuts on the outside of the body and then you don't have to go through all that metabolic expense. I guess that's an interesting theory. And then because elephants through a quirk of evolutionary biology ended up with them on the inside of their bodies, they have to make a bunch more P53 to prevent the sperm from getting damaged when it's being created in this hotter environment. I accept that as a theory, and I hope that you do the research and I get to make a SciShow about it someday. I mean, I don't know why we don't already have a SciShow that's called Elephants Giant Hot Testicles might be the reason they get less cancer, except for the fact that obviously we'd have to write our own version of that headline because that would be plagiarism. So another thing that we know about mammoth sex has to do with the last mammoths on Earth. The last mammoths on Earth lived on a place called Wrangell Island. Let's go to maps. This is Wrangell Island. The mammoths got there. This is obviously a long way away from Russia, but they got there because at the time, I think the sea level was lower and also uh, there would have been ice that stretched out to that island in the winter and so they could walk across that ice bridge. But then eventually got, they got stranded there. And according to a recent paper, the last mammoths that got stranded here, they started from a breeding population of like eight individuals. Now this isn't a very big island, but it's a bigger island than, than that. It can hold a lot more than eight individuals, but eight individuals got stranded here and they created the last population of mammoths. And that population was stable for thousands of years, which is wild because of course you're gonna be pretty inbred. And at the peak of their population, and for most of the time they were there, there were about 300 individuals. Now, 300 individuals is plenty, but from a breeding stock of just eight, that's very bad. To give you a sense of the scale of this island, I don't know, you can kind of get a feel of it just because it's not that big, but it's about the size of like two Rhode Islands, which is the smallest U.S. state. So this is not a big place, but it's big enough that it was able to sustain a population of 300 mammoths for thousands of years, beyond when the mammoths died off in the mainland. So we have all of Earth here where there used to be mammoths and then this one place where there were still mammoths 3,000 years ago. And a lot of people say like there were woolly mammoths on Earth at the same time as the Great Pyramids of Giza were being built. But no, they were there 2,000 years after that. The Giza pyramids were basically ruins by the time mammoths went extinct. And I say that this is like the coolest possible way to find woolly mammoths because that's the only place they existed. If we had started doing exploration and we had a fairly good idea of what the earth looked like, and then we found an island that had 300 individuals of an entirely new species that look dramatically different from anything else anywhere else on the earth that and like the extinction of the rest of them is totally lost to human memory that would have been so cool but instead we just have to live with the reality that 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 almost happened and that they were there and then they died out. And we're not entirely sure why. We don't think people killed mammoths on Wrangell Island because the bones there, and there are lots of bones there, do not have uh, evidence of tools or anything, any butchering or anything like that. So we think that probably there was just like a, a series of bad climate things that happened and, and that led to the, the last of the mammoths dying. But one thing that we can infer from this is that the female woolly mammoths, who are the ones who decide who they mate with, we can infer this, this is a supposition, but we're maybe somehow good at avoiding having babies with mammoths they were closely related to. Otherwise, it would be kind of very hard for if you had sort of natural random interbreeding for that much inbreeding to not have been a sort of catastrophic problem. And this like makes some sense with regards to female elephants and their mate choice, which seems to be something that has thought in it. They are choosy, they can be choosy, and they are choosy. And remember when we talked about females calling for long, long distances to attract distant males? That is an indication that females are interested in breeding with 
males that are not from around here. You know, they want more genetic diversity. In the case of Wrangell Island, that's not a big enough place really to call from that distance, but it does seem like that probably was quite good for them. And also in the case of woolly mammoths, there's been some research on their genetic diversity. And look, they did have a humongous range and that allowed them to interbreed a lot more than is happening right now with elephant populations we've got going on today. But it does look like, I like this, this sentence here. It looks like the hotbed for mammoth dating was right around the Great Lakes, right around here. So Toronto was date night 12,000 years ago. Downtown Toronto, woolly mammoths, the ladies, low frequency hum, the big males fighting over them, the 25 year old males being like, I guess I'll just watch. I shouldn't have said it like that, but I did. And now the video's ended. And oh my gosh, I'm back on this tab. Look, I'm backing this project right now. Cause look at these absolutely beautiful mammoth figures. And yeah, I do want to get it in front of more people. So if you know anybody who might be interested in it, tweet it out email it out, let people know. It's an amazing present for the biggest nerd in your life. Who's the biggest nerd in your life? They want this, I promise you. As the biggest nerd in the people in my life's life, they want this. I've already got mine though. So Catherine, if you're watching, I'm sorry. I already bought mine, but I hopefully I will get to buy more. Okay, goodbye.